Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Sarah Anderson. I'm with the Institute for Policy Studies. And like many people in this room, I consider myself a veteran of the 2017 tax policy battle. Can we, can we hear it from some of the other uh, veterans of that battle in the room? I'm still, I'm still nursing my wounds a little bit. I have to say it doesn't help that almost every day I read about corporate CEOs cashing in on their windfalls from the corporate tax cuts. But I really agree with uh, Frank Clementi, who's here from Americans for Tax Fairness. He has said so many times that we might have lost the legislative battle in late 2017, but we won the battle for public opinion in that fight. And uh, it's been really exciting for me to see that people totally get it, that we cannot just, the goal cannot be just to go back to where we were in 2017. In our time of extreme inequality, we need to go much bigger and bolder. And at IPS, it's been so exciting to be working with groups uh, at the ground uh, level, like the Poor People's Campaign and Jobs with Justice, who are taking on the tax fight like they never have before. We're going to hear more from them this afternoon. But I'm really excited now because I get to moderate this panel with the people who've been really doing the nitty gritty policy work that is so critical to support these movement groups. And uh, we're going to be hearing today first from Chai Ching Huang of Center on Budget and Policy Priority. She's going to talk about income taxes. Then we're going to move on to how can we make a dent in these accumulated grand fortunes. And first we'll hear from Lily Batchelder from the NYU Law School about wealth taxes. And then from Greg Lyerson of the Washington Center on Equitable Growth about estate and insurance taxes, uh, inheritance taxes. And then finally we'll hear from Josh Bivens of EPI on this uh, proposal for a surtax on the top 0.1% that would apply to both ordinary income and um, income from investment. So we will start out first with uh, Chai Ching Wang. Right, so um, my job as you heard is to cover how we can fix individual income and business taxation to better tax the rich in about six minutes. Um, <laughs> There are so many ways. <laughs> Our friends at the Center for American Progress, Americans for Tax Fairness, ITEP, Equitable Growth, many others in the room have all got great reports that set out menus of many progressive revenue raising options. And of course the Center on Budget will add to that uh, genre in due course with our own report. But uh, rather than going through the specific items on the menu, I'm going to make a more general case that many of those excellent items are complementary. Um, we're at a part of the political cycle where there's a tendency to focus on contrasts and competition between ideas. Um, but as policy advocates and analysts, we can also pay attention to the ways that many options for taxing the rich are in fact, uh, do in fact strengthen and complement each other. There are real trade-offs and choices to be made pros and cons to be considered, but we shouldn't get pulled too far into false choices when it comes to addressing the very many parts of the tax code that we need to fix if we're to adequately tax the incomes of the very rich. So let me present to you six sets of compliments. First, to tax the incomes of the rich effectively, we need to better tax all of their sources of income, both from wealth and from work. And that means paying attention to all different parts of the tax code. Now for most households, the biggest source of income is compensation for work, wages and salaries and the like. By contrast, those at the very top get a much larger share of their incomes from things like businesses, uh, real estate. Think dividends, the growth in the, in the value of businesses. Lots of that income never shows up on tax returns. And if it does, it faces lower rates than taxes on income from work. And my co-panelists are going to set out some really great ways to address these big holes in the tax code. So, and those are very direct ways at getting at that problem. And in ways that turn out to be very complementary, to ensure that the very well off face tax on all of their income, we also need to adequately tax their income from labor. One reason why is that income from work is also very concentrated at the top. Not as extremely concentrated as inherited wealth or income from um, capital gains, but still quite concentrated. So about 10% of all labor income goes to the top 1%. Um, think about CEO pay and how that's been doing relative to the pay of ordinary workers. 
another reason why is that the tax advisors of the very wealthy are very good at finding ways to report income as whatever kind it is that will get the lower rate. So while the tax return data um, tells us a story where it may look as though we're doing a little bit better at taxing the labor income of the very wealthy than their income from capital gains and so on, what's, uh, a lot of what's really the labor income of the very rich might in fact be showing up on tax returns um, as business income or capital gains and in fact facing quite low tax rates. Um, the 2017 tax law took us in the wrong direction on that as, as very many other things and opened up larger and more lucrative holes in the tax code that high income people can try to use to avoid the top individual income tax rates. What their advisors are now calling a bonanza of loopholes and planning opportunities. They can pretend that their income from work is the income of a pass through business and, 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 and report that business income on their individual tax return. And just for doing that, they get a 20% discount on the top tax rate. Recent research suggests that even before this giant new tax avoidance opportunity, um, this, the, the, a large share of the income of so-called pass-through businesses was actually just the labor income of very high earners disguised as business income to get lower tax rates and tax benefits. The law's very, very deep cut in the corporate rate also means that corporate taxes are a newly attractive option for the wealthy to shelter income in to get a much lower corporate tax rate. So to ensure that the very rich pay more tax on their economic incomes, we need to address all of this stuff comprehensively. Capital gains and pass-through income and corporate income and ordinary income that shows up as salaries and wages and transfers of extraordinary wealth. Otherwise, the income of the rich will just find a way to whatever effective rate is lowest. They will find a way to the crack in the dam um, and, and, and find where that dam is weakest. And, and, and as we heard from Representative Schakowsky, there are, there are ways of putting together packages that include items from across this menu and strengthen the, the dam across its length. Second, and similarly, broadening tax bases and increasing tax rates are two great tastes that taste great together. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you broaden the base, it limits tax breaks that lawmakers put into the code deliberately, also reduces loopholes that um, have accidentally made, into, made their way into the code, um, and doing that ensures that more income faces the top statutory rates. So for every percentage point you increase this top statutory rate, uh, the less inefficient tax avoidance you'll get and the more revenue you'll raise. Third, federal and state and local opportunities abound. Um, states can make progress on taxing the rich immediately in their states. Uh, better taxation of capital gains, estates, and, and so on. Um, but also, some of the more fundamental reforms that we'll hear about would make it administratively much easier for the states to do more on taxing the incomes of the very rich. Fourth, proposals to tax the, the, the extremely, extremely wealthy and the merely very, very wealthy um, can also coexist. And we've heard that from Professor Krugman um, before, so I won't uh, go over that ground. But um, again, all of the above uh, may be a way forward through that. And finally, we should, uh, uh, sorry, fifth, we should both change policy to shut down avenues for tax avoidance and we need to adequately fund the depleted um, IRS. 25% cut in enforcement funding over the last um, eight or nine years, 30% cut in enforcement staff, and guess what? It's the audits of millionaires and the, the wealthiest corporations that are down the most. And uh, finally, we've heard a lot about non-tax ideas. Uh, in competition law, in democracy, and minimum wage, and labor market reform, and immigration. All of those are highly complementary with the tax ideas that we're talking about as well. So um, my answer, and, and um, if whoever's tallying up the ballots will see the write-in answer um, for question three, all of the above, please. Um, that, that was me. <laughs> I, I would just, there are real trade-offs, but I'll just make a plea to think about also the ways in which um, we can be sort of stronger together with some of these different ideas.
um, thank you for having me today and for organizing this incredible conference. And um, just to mix things up a bit, I'm actually going to be talking about uh, wealth transfers, and Greg is going to be talking about uh, taxing wealth and capital income, although I think we're both equally passionate about each other's subjects. So, um, so I'm going to focus on one of the largest components of income and wealth, um, which is wealth transfers. I'm not sure if the slides are coming up. Um, but uh, each year there are about, great, uh, each year there are about $500 billion of bequests, and inheritances represent about 40% of all wealth and about 4% of household income. So they're very large. Um, I think taxing wealth transfers is key to reducing economic inequality, and it does so in ways that the other taxes cannot completely, even though I totally agree with Chai Ching that we need an all of the above approach. Um, so there are two kinds of economic inequality that I think policymakers should care about. Um, the first is economic disparities within generation, um, and wealth transfers increase this kind of inequality on an absolute basis. They don't actually on a relative basis, which we can talk about if anyone's interested. But equally important is inequality of economic opportunity. And as you can see on this chart, it's very small, but um, the U.S. is all the way in the top right, which means that we're both highly unequal in terms of income and wealth and all those measures, but we also uh, have very low levels of intergenerational economic mobility. And we're basically tied um, with Italy and the United Kingdom in terms of how much of a father's economic advantage or disadvantage is passed on to his son. And all the other countries, which are also high-income countries, um, have much more economic mobility across generations than we do. Um, so what this means is that in the U.S., um, to an especially large extent, economic disparities reflect the luck of your birth and not hard work or even other kinds of luck during life. Um, financial inheritances worsen this kind of inequality dramatically. According to one study, the effect of them on intergenerational immobility is larger than the effects of IQ, schooling, and personality combined. And um, they're also distributed very unequally. So you can see in this chart, um, the higher income you are, the more you tend to inherit. If I had ranked everybody by their inheritance size, the top 1% of inheritors receive about a quarter of all bequests. Uh, so increasing the progressivity of income and payroll taxes and creating a wealth tax would go a long way towards addressing both of these types of inequality. Um, the chart on the prior uh, page showed that the two are pretty closely correlated, economic inequality and intergenerational immobility. But there would still be big holes if this wasn't cover, uh, coupled with stronger taxes on wealth transfers. Um, so let's just take an example of a wealthy person who bequeaths $100 million. And it's all in stock from a company that she founded, and so she hasn't actually paid any capital gains tax on that stock. Um, under current law, there's a provision called stepped-up basis, which means that the donor doesn't have to pay tax on that $100 million ga gain because she hasn't stole the stock. It also means that the heir doesn't have to pay tax on that $100 million gain, when they sell the stock um, to the extent that the gain accrued um, up to the point where they received the stock. So all of that capital gains tax is forgiven forever. Heirs also never have to pay tax under the income or payroll tax on the amounts they inherit. So even if that $100 million of stock didn't have an accrued gain, you don't have to pay tax on receiving $100 million. So what that means is the income and payroll tax rates on inherited income are essentially 0%. Now, wealth transfer taxes pay, play a really key role in addressing this unfairness. Um, but they are so limited right now, and they've eroded so much over time, that this chart, chart shows that the tax rate on inherited income is only about a quarter of the rate on income from work and savings. And all of that tax is from the estate tax, which is pretty limited. Um, so there's three ways I want to talk about that we could um, improve wealth transfer taxes. Um, the first is to repeal stepped-up basis, so that accrued gains on bequeathed uh, assets are taxed immediately. 
Each year, there's hundreds of billions of dollars um, in capital gains that escape taxation. And one option is to tax these accrued gains um, when the heir sells the asset, like we do for gifts made during life. This would raise about $105 billion over the decade. Um, Obama proposed a more robust version of this, which would tax the accrued gains at the time the heir receives the inheritance, and also he would have raised the capital gains rate um, a bit by 4.2 percentage points. There would be some exemptions. And this proposal would have raised $265 billion. Um, it also would have been very progressive. The top 1% uh, would have borne 99% of the burden, and the top 1 in 1,000 would have borne 80% of the burden. So uh, the second way that we can improve wealth transfer taxes is to improve the estate tax and strengthen it. After the 2017 bill, um, the estate tax now only applies to uh, bequests per couple over $22.8 billion, and it's only 40% on amounts over that threshold. So last year it was only paid by about 1,900 estates, which is less than one in 1,000 in the US. It raised about 15 billion. Um, one option I've listed here is to go back to 2009 law, which had a seven million per couple exemption and a 45% rate. That would raise about 500, sorry, 270 billion. And a more aggressive option um, would be to raise the top rate on larger estates if it peaked at 65% uh, on estates over a billion, it would raise about $520 billion. And this has been proposed by uh, a number of uh, members of Congress, including Sanders, uh, former Senator Clinton, Warren, Booker, and Schakowsky. Um, and it sounds like um, she's actually gonna be moving into the uh, next and final option I wanted to discuss, um, which is to replace an estate tax with an inheritance tax. So an inheritance tax is different in that the rate depends on how much the heirs receive rather than how much is bequeathed. And under my preferred approach, we just eliminate the income tax exemption for transfers over a certain amount and apply a 15% surtax on top of that to reflect the payroll tax. So if this exemption was 2.1 million per heir, it would raise about 270 billion. Um, and if it was one and a quarter million, it would raise about 500 billion. Uh, and I'm really excited that uh, Representative Schakowsky is, has announced that she's gonna be pursuing this approach. Um, so as this side explains, um, the main difference between an estate tax and an inheritance tax is that the tax rate's lower under an inheritance tax if you have lots of heirs, and it's higher if you have fewer heirs. So the result is that they different, uh, burden different people, and you can see that in the Venn diagram. Um, on a dollar basis, though, the difference isn't that dramatic. It's about 30% difference in um, uh, who is burdened by the tax. So instead, I think the main advantage is political. And estate tax opponents, as you all heard, have billed the estate tax as a harsh tax on hardworking, generous, small business owners, especially tons of farmers, uh, just at the moment they die. Nothing could actually be further from the truth. Um, the New York Times and American Farm Bureau have never found a farm that has been sold to pay the estate tax. And experts on the left and right agree that it is borne by heirs and not by the decedent. But I think the advantage of inheritance tax is it shifts the form of the tax to reflect the economic reality, which is that in both cases, with an estate and inheritance tax, um, their taxes on privileged heirs who have inherited so much that they don't have to ever work again if they don't want. And if we didn't have either tax, we wouldn't, they wouldn't owe a dime on the amounts that they're inheriting. So with that, I'll turn it over to Greg. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about uh, different ways to tax wealth, right? And sort of my, my goal in the next five minutes or so is to walk through sort of how, how you can tax wealth in different ways, how they relate to each other, and what each of them is doing. 
uh, let's start first with a, a couple of definitions. Uh, first, what is wealth, right? Wealth is the value of everything you own at a particular point in time. So you add up uh, financial assets like a bank account, a 401k, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, non-financial assets like real estate or a business, uh, a house, cars, works of art, what have you, yachts, um, subtract off uh, debt uh, like a mortgage or other forms of borrowing, and that's your wealth. It's what you have at a point in time, right? Income, on the other hand, is a flow. It's the resources you gain over a period of time. So you can think about uh, wages and salaries, about uh, interest and dividends, profits from a business. These are all forms of income. And the key idea to keep in mind as we think about uh, taxing wealth is that wealth generates income. So bonds pay interest, stocks pay dividends, businesses generate profits, real estate generates rents, and all of these different forms of assets can increase in value. And all of the, all, all, in all of these ways, wealth generates income. So we can tax wealth uh, either by taxing the wealth itself or by taxing the income from wealth. So imagine for a moment that you had uh, $50 million, and over the course of a year, that generates $2 million of income. Right. We could tax 1% of that wealth to generate $500,000. We could tax 25% of that income to also generate $500,000. Right? So we can tax the wealth or we can tax the income from wealth. And through either route, we can achieve very similar ends. And so that takes us to sort of the three basic approaches to taxing wealth. First is sort of the classic wealth tax. This is the percentage of wealth uh, paid annually in tax. So you have $50 million, you pay 1% or $500,000 in tax. Right? The second approach, uh, this is what's called mark-to-market taxation by economists. You may also hear the term uh, accrual taxation, uh, pay-as-you-grow taxation, as, as Representative Schakowsky suggested. Right? These are all sort of the same thing, and it's a, the most comprehensive approach to taxing the income from wealth. And the key thing you do under this approach is you include in your taxable income every year the increase in the value of all of your assets, regardless of whether you sell them or not. Right? So you have a $50 million stock portfolio that increases in value to $60 million. Right? That's $10 million of income that you include on your tax return. That's the idea of, of mark-to-market or accrual-based taxation. Right. Uh, the third approach is known as the deferral charge. Uh, this is sort of the most technical or complex of these approaches. Um, it's also the closest to current law in an important sense. And the way it works is that you continue to tax investment gains uh, when assets are sold. So if I, I sell my stock portfolio, I subtract the purchase price from the, the uh, proceeds, and that difference is income. Right? That's the way it works under current law. What's wrong with that approach? Well, assume I, I uh, sold 10 million, I stole the stock portfolio for $10 million of gain, right? I did that this year. I didn't earn that money this year. I might have held those assets for a decade, right? But over that decade, I was reporting no income and paying no tax, right? A worker, on the other hand, they're working that entire 10-year period, right? Each year they get wages, they report those wages on their tax return, and they pay tax, right? I was earning money, reporting no income, and paying no tax. And so I was fundamentally getting an interest-free loan from the government every single year along the way by virtue of holding my wealth or earning my income in the form of income from wealth. Right? And so the deferral charge is the interest on that loan. It says we're going to continue to tax assets when you sell them, but you have to pay us the interest on that loan you got for the entire past decade. So that's the deferral charge approach. Uh, now, all three of these approaches are about the structure of the tax system. They're about the ways we tax wealth and the income from wealth. You can use uh, whatever rates you want and whatever exclusions and so forth with each of these approaches. And that's particularly important for the, the last two approaches, the mark-to-market approach and the deferral charge approach. These are both uh, uh, taxi taxing the income from wealth, and they operate as sort of reforms to the existing tax system. And as, you, as others have discussed, right, we have preferential rates for capital gains and dividends under current law. Right? When you implement these reforms, you would also repeal, or you could repeal and should repeal, uh, the preferential rates for capital gains and dividends at the same time. Part of the reason to adopt these reforms is they shut down avoidance strategies wealthy investors use uh, to avoid paying tax on their gains. So if you enact these reforms first um, or at the same time as you raise rates, you're going to raise a lot more revenue from raising the rates than you would if you didn't implement these reforms um, and thus still retained a variety of strategies that wealthy taxpayers could use um, to avoid paying tax on their income. 
Um, now, the other thing I want to touch on here, as Representative Schakowsky suggested, you can mix and match from this menu uh, based on which types of taxes will work better for which assets. Um, so you can use a mark-to-market approach for publicly traded securities where there are observable values for these stocks or bonds out there that we can just read, that you can report those values on your, your tax return every year, um, and we, we can measure them and know what they are. But you might use the deferral charge approach for assets where they're harder to value, um, and so we use the sales price effectively as a means of valuing the assets. Right? The, sa the price at which the asset is sold is the basis for valuing the gains along the way. Right? So you can mix and match these different approaches approaches, right? we use the property tax on, on real estate at the uh, local government level. Right? We can mix and match these across taxes um, in sort of whatever mix uh, uh, sort of most effectively solves our administrative compliance and political uh, challenges. Um, now, I've suggested all three of these taxes are, are very similar. They're doing very similar things. Um, what can we expect from any of them? The revenue potential is quite large. Think a trillion dollars plus over the next decade for each of these. Obviously, if you, you know, change the rates, um, you can move those numbers around a lot. Um, but you know, the numbers are big. Uh, and in terms of progressivity, these are among the most progressive policy options uh, available to policymakers, both because the distribution of wealth itself is highly skewed and because you can further uh, uh, target each of these proposals to the top 1% or the top 0.1% through your choice of exemption. And obviously, there are relationships between uh, the revenue raised and the progressivity, depending on how you set your rates and, and how you target it. Uh, so that's uh, the, the, the top level overview of the three basic ways uh, to tax wealth. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all. Oh, yeah, Josh is going next. Sorry. OK. Um, do I just go one more? And <laughs> OK, sorry. <laughs> I will say a couple words while, while queues up. Um, I'm going to talk um, about a much more specific proposal than, than some of the, the previous ones. I'm going to argue that one of the very first tools we take out of the toolkit as we do progressive tax reform, hopefully, um, in coming years, is a surtax on high-income households. Um, and I think um, if this is, yes, queued up now, I'm just going to start with, you know, why a surtax is a good idea. I mean, frankly, this is why progressive taxation generally is a good idea, but I'm going to argue it applies specifically to the surtax. This is a chart that basically shows how different the economic experience of the top 0.1% has been relative to everyone else in the economy. And so what you have on the vertical axis is average annual income growth. And on the horizontal axis, you have households ranked from poorest to richest. Um, this is pre and post tax. I mean, a couple things should stand out from this. One is the richer you are, the faster your average income growth has been. And it's extremely nonlinear. The top 0.1% has seen a radically different experience, even than its sort of peers in the rest of the top 1%. And so that, that's, I think, why we are appropriately focusing on that. I think the other really striking thing from this is the, the top has seen such incredibly rapid growth and has pulled up the overall average so much that fully about 85% of families saw income growth lower than average over that time period. And that should strike everyone as a little bit strange. Um, and I would say that the US economy has been pretty strange because of this. The, over these same decades where you see this really big increase in inequality, um, tax policy has been much less equalizing. That top line is the average effective tax rate, all in, all kinds of taxes, federal, state, local, on the top 0.1%. That bottom line is the same thing for the bottom 90%. There used to be a really wide difference between these two lines that has converged a lot. So as inequality has risen enormously, tax policy has actually become less equalizing over that time. Something um, others have mentioned, a really key thing, if you want to tax the incomes of the top 0.1%, you have to tax capital income. This is a figure that shows the share of overall income by income groups that is accounted for by capital income. In this, in, this includes, and it's, it's complicated, but it's probably even a little higher. It, that's probably too high for the bottom 90%. It includes imputed rent from owning your homes. But still, the point is the top 0.1% has a much higher share of income coming from capital-based incomes than everyone else, even again, their peers and the rest of the top 1%. So that's the backdrop. Um, and I think one thing that's becoming really clear in this whole discussion 
is that um, when it comes to getting an equitable share of revenue from the rich and using tax policy to level the economic playing field more broadly, th there's not gonna be one single silver bullet. Um, we need a big toolkit in large part because the rich are so good at sort of adapting to any single change in the tax code. I'd also say for the full bore progressive agenda that we wanna do, eventually we're gonna have to get a bigger contribution from members of the middle class if we really wanna do ambitious spending. That said, I think there's a really strong case to be made for having at hand an explicitly and laser focused progressive tax that can be one of the first things out of the toolkit um, that can raise enough money for a significant increase in social insurance or public investment. It can cut through some of the Gordian knots of complexity from income shifting that people here have talked about. Um, and also a tax that does not spill over at all onto the middle class, I think can be really useful as a confidence building measure. When we tell people we wanna get a much bigger contribution from the rich and we wanna build a better society from it, having the first thing out of the gate just not spill over at all onto the middle class, I think can be a really useful thing. Um, I would say many tax changes we wanna do are really progressive overall, like say a capital gains tax increase, but there will be some middle class household to pay higher taxes, that's fine. Again though, I think the value of a surtax, which I'll talk about in a second, is that there's no spillover at all. Um, and so let me just talk a little bit about what this surtax is. Basically, a surtax would take another 10 percentage points off the top of all adjusted gross income over a $2 million threshold. Um, $2 million threshold, it's really close to the top 0.1%. I would argue it's not even in the neighborhood of anyone's consumption of middle class, and so th there's not that idea. Um, at the risk of lecturing a group that knows better about what marginal tax rates are, if you do not make $2 million, you will pay zero extra with this surtax. Um, <laughs> if you make exactly $2 million, you will pay zero extra. If you make $3 million a year, you'll pay the surtax on that million dollars above the threshold. That's an extra $100,000. That sounds like a lot of money. To normal people, that's a lot of money. That will increase their tax rate by about 3.3 percentage points. I think they'll live. And the real value of this surtax is the money it raises from people who make well above $3 million a year. Um, I would say this chart is just meant to convince you yet again, there's very little spillover. I'm not gonna linger on it too much, but that horizontal line is where the surtax hits. That is sort of household incomes going from the bottom all the way up to the 99.9th percent. As you can see, very little spillover. And so finally, the question is, you know, how much, oh, all right, my last one disappeared. How much revenue would it raise? Um, basically, it would raise on the order of $75 billion in the first year. It would get to over $800 billion over a 10-year period. How much money is this? You know, it, it's not single payer money, but it is enough money to make a really ambitious investment in America's kids. If you look at estimates for what universal high quality pre-K is for all three and four-year-olds, that's about $40 billion. If you add on top of that, sort of capping early childcare expenses at say 7% of family income, that's probably another 40 billion. This gets you enough to make a serious investment in children under the age of five. And one thing I had, you know, we should make that investment. We are really stingy when it comes to money we spend on kids relative to other rich nations around the world. And so I think, <laughs> and I think the surtax could, could turn that around, and I just note, it has a pedigree. It was part of the Affordable Care Act version that passed out of the House of Representatives, or a version of it was. Unfortunately, it did not become law then. The upside to that is, it's sitting out there, we should put it to use. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, I think I'm mic'd okay. Before we open it up uh, to the audience for Q&A, I just wanna give the panelists a chance to comment on the interplay between some of the ideas that you've been talking about. I heard uh, Lily and Chai Cheng both saying, you know, with regard to the ballot, that they're for all of the above. But do you wanna add a any more about how they might um, I interact with each other? I, I also heard Josh say it might not be a bad idea to have the surtax idea be first out of the gate because it doesn't spill over to the middle class in any way. Do you have thoughts on sequencing or the, the connections between the different proposals? Well, I, I guess one thing to, to bear in mind is um, a key benefit of the mark to market or accrual tax uh, proposal that Greg mentioned is currently, and, and we could probably have a very long debate about whether this is true, the JCT and CBO estimate that if you raise the capital gains rate above about 28 or 30%, you start losing revenue. 
And the reason is that people respond by deferring the realization of gains even more. And so I, I think one thing to bear in mind is as we increase the tax rates on ordinary income and hopefully increase the tax rates on capital gains as well, um, it becomes more and more important to start thinking out about proposals along the lines that uh, Greg and Representative Schakowsky laid out, um, at least in terms of how they estimate these proposals. Prevent that gaming of the system. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, I think it's exactly right that all, there's an important all of the above element to all of these proposals. I think sort of where the, the interactions between them perhaps become more important um, is that we might dial the particular rates or the particular uses we put each proposal to differently uh, in a different context. Um, and so one way, one example of this is you could think of using a wealth tax as, as the basis for your system of, of taxing capital income and wealth broadly, um, or you could think of using a, a mark-to-market or accrual uh, uh, system as the basis for taxing capital income broadly, and then use a wealth tax as more of a targeted tool against wealth inequality. There's still in this world of all of these are of great taste that go together, as Chai Ching said, um, but if you sort of zoom in a little bit, you might, might target them in different ways, or you, you, the exact rates you choose to set might be slightly different depending on which ones uh, you've used elsewhere. To try, <laughs> to try another extended um, food metaphor, if you've, if you've been to dim sum or yum cha, y you can put together a really great meal lots and lots of different ways. You, you probably don't want to order no veggies or like 12 servings of veggies. <laughs> so, so you do kind of probably want, like Greg, Greg listed sort of three major ways of, of getting at the same sorts of income or wealth broadly defined. You probably don't want each of those on every single asset, um, but you want to choose, pick and choose between them for the different asset types, and also think about how it fits in within your, your sort of broader meal in terms of are you, are you using the sort of wealth approach as a somewhat of a backstop, a targeted approach to pick up some other things that aren't being got at by income tax reforms, or a, a sort of a, a, a different base that's complementary. How does it pair with the wine? <laughs> Uh, Josh, do you want to say anything? Yeah, just, just a couple thoughts. I mean, I, I think it's true. These are all super strongly complementary to, to each other. Um, I would say just to be clear, if I wasn't clear, the, the adjusted gross income the surtax applies to includes capital gains. And so it's true if you, if you really thought you were already near the, the revenue maximizing rate, which, you know, who knows, um, but that, that's what some people will say, then you definitely want to do some of the base broadening and the other sort of fundamental changes to make sure the surtax isn't somehow pushing you above that and, and sacrificing some of the revenue. I would say as well, you know, there's not just going to be one progressive tax reform that happens uh, over the next, I mean, I hope not, I hope there's many, uh, that's not the way it usually works. And I would say one, one way to think about it is, I think, um, you've got a lot of the base broadening that I think is really good for sort of the, the centerpiece tax reform bill. And then you have a lot of things that just needed social spending that requires a pay for. Um, and that's where I think the more specific proposals you can attach those to. And so I think that that's two ways to think about it as well. What is the overarching structure of the tax system versus what are very specific pieces that we can tag to really valuable social spending? Great. Well, why don't we open it up to the audience and we've got our mic people here and, and so forth. Um, right, yeah, and I do, I see wonky people in the audience and political people and Activists, don't, uh, anybody can ask questions of these folks, so don't, uh, not just the experts. Thank you. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin, and I'm certainly not an expert, but, and I was late. <laughs> Is someone going to talk about the corporate tax? That big, oh, all right. Yes, yes, but yes. It would <laughs> uh, it's, it's easier in some ways because it doesn't hit particular individuals. And corporations should be paying for the roads and the bridges and the infrastructure that they all use. Certainly the biggest part of the Republican tax. What, well, a, do you what a perfect opening to something that I, I sort of wished I could spend more time on. I, I, think, I think it's absolutely right. We should be looking beyond undoing the impacts of the 2017 tax law. But there are a lot of really terrible impacts that we can be undoing as well. And the changes in the corporate tax were, uh, you know, the driver both in policy terms and in political terms of that entire bill. Um, 
and about a third of the corporate tax rate cut goes to the top 1%, about 20% goes to the top 0.1%. And as I said, as in, part of, in, in terms of a comprehensive approach to taxing the incomes of the very wealthy, leaving that shelter hanging out there for people to put their income in, if, e even if you address some of these other, other parts of the tax code, is a really, uh, a really damaging thing. So that is something we should absolutely be looking to, to undo, uh, raise effective corporate rates, um, both in terms of the rate and the base. Uh, the pass-through deduction was another one that I didn't linger on, but um, about half of that goes to millionaires, and um, again, a lot of that income is already disguised labour income of the very wealthy. So it's effectively creating a venue to make the top individual income tax rates optional for high wealth people who have good enough tax advisors to get them around the very complicated guardrails in the law. We're going to go from front to back and then back up front. So, yeah. Hi, Olivia Allen from the Children's Funding Project. Um, I'm curious about, I don't want to distract from the conversation about um, national approaches, but I'm curious about what you think about vertical alignment between state and federal approaches when it comes to advocating for some of these things. Um, uh, we, we find it easier to work sometimes at the state level, but um, get a lot of pushback from folks at the federal level who are trying to pass similar potentially conflicting items. I think, I think it's a great idea to be pushing almost all of these ideas at a state level. Um, I mean, I will say that um, some of them are fairly complex, so it would be a heavy lift, which uh, doesn't mean that it wouldn't be great um, for states to work on them. Um, for example, you know, moving to mark to market or um, major changes to the corporate tax base or um, inheritance tax um, would uh, take a fair amount of time to draft and think through all of the ways to um, prevent loopholes. So um, I think it'd be great for states to take this on, but there is a certain advantage to doing so federally. Um, and then I'd add that if we can get these through federally, that makes it a lot easier for the states to piggyback on this. A lot of the states, their income tax code keys off of what federal law is. And so once you had a accrual tax or mark-to-market system in place federally, then it'd be really easy for the states just to say, okay, we're gonna tax that income too. Um, but it's much harder for them to do so, at least technically, um, on their own. If I could just push on that a little bit more, I'm sure you've all heard the argument that if you do s stuff at the state level to go after the very rich, that those people will just move away. So what's your <laughs> response for that? It's, it's not borne out by the evidence. Um, one of my colleagues here, uh, Liz McNichol, can speak um, much more directly to that, but, w but in terms of uh, underscoring Lily's point, uh, sh she's put out another one of these great genres of menus of options where states can move immediately on a number of these fronts, um, put the investments towards, uh, put, put the revenues towards investments that strengthen state economies overall rather than um, have any uh, bad effect on, on economic growth. Um, and also help build the case towards reforms both across the country and at the federal level. I mean, I think as Lily mentioned, um, some of these more wide-ranging reforms to tax administration that would go along with some of the uh, bigger federal proposals that we've mentioned would help states move forward as well, but there are, there are very simple, easy um, to implement and politically salient ways that states can move forward immediately in capital gains and estate and inheritance taxation um, and an income taxation as well. Okay, uh, yep. John, Michael Kink. Hey, Mike Kink from the Center for Popular Democracy and the Hedge Clippers campaign. Um, some of the most explosive increases in inequality have been driven by private equity and hedge fund managers on Wall Street. And in addition to the infamous carried interest loophole, I'm sure there's a lot of tax avoidance schemes that are particularly used in those industries. So I was wondering if you have any things to offer campaigners that are trying to fight financialization and the impact of those kinds of players on the economy and on inequality. So I, I think the, the you know, underlying, let's say 85% of, and that's a very serious number, um, of the strategies used there is, is the opportunity to defer uh, tax until assets are sold, right? The, 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 you know, the deferral is the engine that makes all of the other strategies work. Um, and so I think the, 
you know, any, all of the, the, the policy options we've discussed that, that claw back on deferral, um, you know, whether that's through, through the, the taxation of investment income, whether it's using wealth itself as the base, whether it's the measurement of income uh, inside corporate solution, um, and I guess I should probably say something about leverage um, and using interest to strip money out of the corporate base. I think all of these are sort of the, the, you know, the, 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 the key ingredient that makes the avoidance strategies there work. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the, you know, all they, they can provide the, the sort of the high level direction for the policy reform to get to. I think the, the challenge of selling some of these problems in terms of, un you know, uh, understanding and and explaining you know how deferral works I think is this sort of the the, the part of the challenge of getting across the finish line for some of those reforms um, but I think it's it's this ability to to play by your own rules to avoid reporting your income the idea that that uh, you know a wage earner reports their income every year no questions asked and all of these other strategies depart from the fact that you don't have to or can make it disappear in return to Josh, you want to yeah, just, just one quick thing. I mean, uh, as well as that, also it's, it's just the, the carried interest loophole is just exploiting the fact that we tax labor income differently versus capital income, and so all the talk here about things that push those together will help. And then I'd add something that didn't come up but is a tax that's really progressive and aimed at sort of the heart of financialization, destructive financialization, the financial transactions tax, I think should definitely be on the menu of reformers. I'll go along with that. <laughs> no, no opposition there. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. My name is Li Yang. Uh, I think our society, the, the, the most urgent issue is really justice and fairness. And what I call is it currently our capitalism is not really capitalism. It, it's what I really call just a robberism. So unless we. <laughs> We really solve this problem. Uh, uh, Robertism, including currently is the PPP, public private partnership, which actually is rob not only individual but also now rob government even more. So unless we do this solving this problem, uh, government is uh, spending is not controllable and an individual rich is, can be suddenly poor, and uh, all the social program, even you have money in the government, suddenly will be yeah. deficit. So um, then I my question is, how are you going to solve this problem in order to have a society in a peaceful manner, rather than every day you are just uh, thinking about taxing, taxing, while you tax almost nothing because they are robbed by somebody else. Yeah, I think that's kind of the question of the day, isn't it? Yeah. Um, anyone want to weigh in on that? I, I think it goes back to Paul Krugman's point earlier. Like, the ideas are there. Like, if, yeah. if we actually had the political ability to, under, to do this, the ideas are there, they would work. The question is organizing the politics to make it possible. Yeah. I think the IRS funding piece is really emblematic yeah. of that problem. Since 2010, year after year after year, death by a thousand cuts, and we really need a uh, you know, well-resourced IRS built back up again in order to get at the income that is already supposedly subject to tax but is not being paid over every year, um, and in order to implement some of these uh, really great policy ideas. Um, so. Right, and this afternoon we will have a panel on campaigning around these issues, so how to connect the great nitty gritty research and policy analysis these folks are doing to people who can really push it forward. So, um, yeah, Frank Clementi. Hi, uh, Frank Clementi, Americans for Tax Fairness. It's probably more for Lily than anybody else, it's the, the lawyer up there. Um, <laughs> uh, how much credence do you put in the constitutional questions around the wealth tax? Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, I'd like to, uh, so if, let's say we had, we're good enough to adopt mark to market uh, and we get an inheritance tax, so we get mark to market uh, going forward and we get the inheritance tax on, on, uh, in the future. How much is a wealth tax or how much is the, the accumulated wealth that, it, you know, that, that folks have uh, that isn't captured going forward, how do we, how do we deal with that uh, in terms of the, the mark to market issue? So on the constitutionality, I, um, 
would, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but based on talking to a lot who are, I wouldn't put a lot of credence in it as a legal matter, um, but I would in terms of how this court would decide. Mm. <laughs> um, so I, I think there's a risk that this court um, would hold a wealth tax unconstitutional. I, I don't think they should, I don't think that's supported, but um, there's a lot of things this court might do that I, I wouldn't agree with. So um, I think the way to reduce that legal risk is to frame um, and to understand a wealth tax as a refinement to the income tax. So um, the constitutional issue is that direct taxes under the Constitution have to be apportioned among the states, and that means by population. And so presumably we wouldn't want a wealth tax that said, you know, per capita in Mississippi it has to raise as much as it does in Connecticut. Um, and uh, there was a constitutional amendment that said the income tax is not a direct tax. So to the extent that we can understand a wealth tax as being a type of income tax, then it should be fine. I, I don't see how even this court could get there. Um, and as an example, um, the Netherlands has uh, something called a dual income tax system where they impute a return to wealth each year and tax that imputed income which is a wealth tax. Um, but I think if you, you know, start framing a wealth tax in, in those forms, it becomes even lower risk. Um, and then I don't think there's really a, a risk that a mark-to-market tax um, would be considered not an income tax. We have mark-to-market features within our income tax right now and relatively small areas of it, and they've never been challenged constitutionally. Another reason you might want to have the, the legal fight or um, as well as sidestepping it is to recall that that, three fifth, that, that, that um, apportionment according to population clause is the same clause that had the three-fifths requirement for how you count up the population. So this um, prohibition against direct taxes, uh, many legal scholars trace that to being part of, you know, tied up in the, the so-called compromise over slavery. So um, the legal argument is that that clause, because it is so tainted by the legacy of slavery and because it was in part there to prevent the taxation of types of wealth out of existence, including slaves, um, should be construed extremely narrowly in today's, um, in today's <laughs> society. I mean, again, that leaves Lily's uh, legal realism question about whether this court would, would do that, but um, it's part of Professor Krugman's point that a lot of the reason why we have a tax and fiscal situation that we do have today does tie back to some of these issues. Point. Okay. To get to the, the second part of that question on, uh, so if you had mark to market taxation, right, uh, how do you deal with, or what is this, what, is, what, what, n what policies are needed to deal with the accumulated stocks of wealth? I think this is both a argument for strong wealth transfer taxes, uh, as Lily discussed on the estate or the inheritance side. It's also, I think, part of why you need uh, uh, realization at death or gift um, to make sure you have actually captured all of the accumulated gains and so that they cannot leak out in those two ways. I think if you have those two components, um, there isn't a sort of, you know, you know, unblocked path out. Um, they're the key ingredients. You could then obviously build on that with, with sort of additional taxes, but those are the key elements uh, to prevent the basic leakage. Okay, who's next? Our way in the back? Chuck, are you getting somebody? There we go. Coming over. Just <laughs> yeah, hi, my name is Victor Taroni. So I, I really support the idea of using all of these instruments and partly because, I think for two reasons. One is that they can reduce avoidance, and two is that if you really want to be effective at taxing the wealthy, you add those up and you can get at pretty high rates. One thing that's missing from this mix is um, a personal expenditure tax, and that's something that um, could be used. It's maybe more in the, in the middle, like the top two or three percent. We can get more revenue from them. But I think it's a, it's a policy instrument that should be thought about and used because, again, you c it's hard to avoid that and also avoid some of these other things. So it would be an additional arsenal in the, in the 
weapon in the arsenal. Thank you. Have any of you looked at that issue? Or should we? Okay, okay. thanks for that, that comment. Uh, next question. Hello, John Starjack. You know, all these various tax schemes are, sound very good, but they're gonna be ineffective unless we get rid of the mechanisms by which the rich hide their income and wealth. And it was extensively described in Guzman's book, The Hidden Wealth of Nations. How do you address that? So I, I think part of this goes to the IRS enforcement point. Um, there is a new regime called FATCA, um, which requires automatic reporting between countries of all financial accounts of US citizens held abroad. And already more than 100 countries have signed on to that. Um, but the problem is the IRS doesn't have the resources to use the data that it's starting to get. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we really need to have a high wealth squad that's starting to really focus right. on finding that hidden wealth. Um, another issue is that the factor regime only covers financial assets. Um, there is a common reporting standard regime that the OECD has been working on, and it has over 100 signatories, but the US is not one of them. So uh, there are some you know, relatively straightforward things that we could do and international efforts we could join if we had a better administration. Great, maybe we'll take one more. Anyone have a burning question here? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Jerome Siegel, I'm the state chair of the newly formed Bread and Roses Party of Maryland. Um, I had uh, another idea to throw into the mix, and it's a wealth tax that deals with a class of assets that um, is substantial and um, doesn't raise legal issues uh, and can't very well be hidden, and it, it's real estate. and. Uh, uh, it's a very good proxy for people's overall wealth holdings. Uh, we've got a very fine-grained tax system throughout the country knowing all about people's real estate. Um, the problem with it is that it's proportional. We've got fixed rate whether you have a $100,000 home or a $10 million estate. And uh, it's a fairly simple change, it would seem to me, to move towards progressive real estate taxation could be something that kicks in with houses as if they're over a million or over two million, mm -hmm. and then goes all the way up, and it could be very, very powerful. Um, my colleague Liz McNichol has actually written about um, the possibility of doing mansion taxes and moving those immediately in the states. As you say, those are the, those are the areas in the states where they have regressive um, tax codes and can ha have direct access to these valuations. They're doing them already as part of their property taxes, so there's an immediate op opportunity there. Um, in, in terms of sort of federal level and real estate taxation, I think part of the, the issue there is reversing all of the completely upside down tax breaks that exempt um, returns from real estate from taxation at the moment. So things like the mortgage interest deduction, um, all of the various carve outs from various provisions that real estate got in the 2017 tax law, like kind exchanges, all, all sorts of different things. I'm sure Lily and Greg and, and Josh will have their favorites, but um, there's a lot of cleaning up to do. I would just flag, I have a couple of colleagues here, Chuck Collins and Jen Wofford, who are working at this on the, the local level in Boston, where they've had a luxury housing boom and have been getting a lot of attention for their research into the impact of that on the local economy. And there's movement around a, a luxury real estate transfer tax in the state of Massachusetts. So that's uh, an exciting part of our work. Um, I think we're going to break a little bit early for lunch because I understand Senator uh, Van Hollen is going to come early. And so your agenda says that we do lunch and then come back at 1, but he needs to start at 12.50. So please be in your seats for that. And let's give a round of applause to our panel. Thanks so much.